please help me welcome Ben and Dion. Thank you. If we can get the mics. Are the mics actually on now? Great. Sounds good. So, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Dion Almer. I'm Ben Galbraith. And uh, we founded uh, Jaxian.com, which is a, a site that performs very poorly on Y slow and page speed. Uh, that's a community for uh, Ajax stuff. And we also now work at Mozilla. And um, that's where we are under Mozilla Labs. And so as you might imagine at Mozilla Labs, we are looking into the future of browsers and uh, where the whole browsing platform is going. But we're more than just browsers. And so what Ben and I actually do, we work in uh, a new developer tools lab. Uh, we've released Bespin. Uh, which was the first release that came out of our lab, which is all about making code editing uh, a very rich social experience on the web. And we're going to show uh, a little bit more on other tools that we're thinking about and stuff like that. So it's not just about the browser, it's about the web as a whole. So um, we're talking a lot about responsiveness um, and performance, obviously, here. And Google is a really fascinating uh, case study here on um, the challenges involved in making a website as responsive as Google's homepage is. When you think about just the data center challenges alone distributing the page um, index that they have across the entire world, and then the code behind that and figuring out how to make um, page rank as accurate as it is and how they're able to actually respider the internet as quickly as they do, um, it's pretty amazing in order to contemplate how they actually manage to serve up all this data to the browser so quickly and result in such a fantastic experience. Um, but what we wanted to do first as we started this talk off is sort of talk about um, what matters beyond simply getting the page to the browser really, really quickly. And it turns out there's a lot more to that story. Yeah, and so let's start with a fun anecdote that's uh, very human, so we kind of feel what's going on. Um, it's hard to see out here, and it's pretty rare at a conference like this, but hopefully there's a few females in the audience and when you think about um, who you'd have fun going out with in fantastic downtown San Jose while you're at the conference, um, this is a picture of one guy that looks a little bit like myself, a little bit chubby in some ways. Um, you know, probably not the, uh, the kind of guy you'd be anxious to go see at a nightclub. So for the girl in the audience, would you like to go out with this guy or would you prefer going out with this guy? <laughs> probably this guy. But the funny part is, so although the interface here is totally different, it turns out the implementation is the same. It's the same guy. It's Jared Leto, an actor that put on weight uh, for what's going on. So what is perceived, as Steve was talking about, and the experience that you get uh, based on how your interface is different uh, varies drastically. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this is a talk on performance, and we'll be talking about responsiveness. But the first point we wanted to make is that the responsiveness of the application, obviously, um, is only part of the story. And in fact, the visual appeal of, of the application has a great deal to do with creating a great user experience. In fact, we want to talk a little bit more about that for a second. So I'm sure you've been to websites that look uh, kind of like this, especially in the day, where there was some research done by a professor uh, in Ontario where he, through this research, doing the studies with real users, found that it takes about 1 20th of a second for us to kind of make some kind of impression on this website. And so we instantly look at that and we probably think about, you know, is this trustworthy? You know, how do you feel when you experience that website? And then there's another product called the halo effect, which means that after that snap judgment, that snap decision, you then kind of take that with you uh, throughout the entire experience with, with this company and this website. So what actually you see right there, just like with the human, on the web page, instantly your users are going to make some kind of judgment about what you are. So we'd really love to spend a long time talking about the importance of the visual appeal of the website and go really deep into that. We don't have a lot of time in this talk, so we want to jump quickly to the relationship between how the web page looks, how the web application looks, and how it behaves. And Jeff Raskin does a great job of tying this together when he basically explains that you know, no matter how much the visual appeal of the website may be to somebody, if the actual interaction they have with that website isn't of a really high quality, then it's going to poison the entire experience. And so that's what we want to focus on today, is how we can create that quality user experience. And we're going to narrow it down a little bit further. Um, when you look at interaction design, there's a ton of principles that we could talk about. 
but it really boils down to two great commandments of interaction design. The first is thou shalt make thine interfaces responsive, and the second is thou shalt keep the data of thy users holy. Um, and we're gonna just narrow down to the first one of these, keeping the interface responsive uh, for a few minutes. So we're humans, we deal with things in the real world, and tactile response is kind of core to, to how we work with things, and that holds through still when we work with computers. So we're working with these kind of facades through our mouse to actually deal with what's going on, but it's really important the kind of feel that you have as you experience the controls that are on the website or in any piece of software that you actually create. So making it feel real and tactile is very important. To show you an example of how this doesn't apply to software, uh, whenever you see the green light here, that means someone's clicked on, uh, on the item. And so we're gonna see an example of a really unresponsive user interface. We're still waiting. It always feels longer when you're up here. It does, you know, you have that temptation not to wait it out, you yeah. know what I mean, just to skip past, but we're gonna wait it out. Um, and so this is an example, obviously, of what we don't wanna create, but it turns out if you, if you analyze um, that a little bit, the first point we wanna make is that um, user interface latency is a terrible user experience. It creates immense frustration um, uh, with users of software systems. But the point we wanna make is just how sensitive we are to interface latency. So we created a little web page um, that's just the background I happen to have on my computer. Um, so we've created a little web page where you can actually click on these things, and I don't know if you can tell when I'm clicking up here on stage, but it lets you go through and see the delays that occur um, when you click on the button. And so the number of milliseconds to the left indicates the number of um, uh, the duration until you actually see a response. But what I found in experimenting with this is that um, I can actually visually detect latencies at very low level. Now, to be honest, 25 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds are pretty much equivalent, but I can actually sense the delta between 50 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds in the UI. And once you get past 100 milliseconds, you very rapidly detect the delays. And what this creates in users, well, we're gonna talk a little bit more, more about that in a, in a minute, but what it creates in users is the feeling that your application isn't well constructed, that it doesn't behave very well, um, but that's actually dig a little bit deeper into that. So Jakob Nielsen has done a lot of research on this, and uh, he's obviously done it on, on uh, the web uh, primarily, but this research goes back to the original days of, of the GUI, the same responsiveness rules kind of take place, and it kind of makes sense when you, when you kind of think about it. Up to 0.1 uh, of a second feels like you're kind of actively working on that data. Your brain is totally in the flow, you're moving along just like you've got this really nice tactile experience. Uh, between that and up to a second, uh, roughly, it feels kind of sluggish, but you're kind of just about keeping up with it, uh, even though your brain may kind of multitask onto other things. And then past a second, that's when things are flipping out uh, all the time. You're going to start getting very frustrated with the data. And with this kind of knowledge, it's, it's obvious why the whole Ajax movement took off, because before that, in the Web 1.0 days, you are always over a second. Every click that you did that wasn't just in a little form or something that went back to the server was going to take quite a long time, depending on what's going on. So you're very frustrated if you wanted to use that for an app. Now, with Ajax, and we'll see kind of more advances that get you even faster and faster, we're able to give people what they really want, which is that very, very nice tactile experience. Jakob happens to be in the area this week, uh, giving a talk about some of his new findings. So we're excited to see what he, he comes up with next. So we want to put this into practice for application interfaces really quickly. So when you build an application GUI, it turns out the architecture is the same, whether you're doing it on Windows using WPF, whether you're doing it uh, on the web, or you, whether you're using Java Swing or some other GUI toolkit. And how it works is this. Um, your input events go through the operating system into a queue. Um, each event is packaged um, into an atomic event on the queue. And then the GUI toolkit is responsible for pulling each of these events in, um, in order out of that queue and doing something with it. Doing something typically boils down to either executing code that you've written in the form of an event listener that's attached to a button or a label or something, or repainting the user interface as a result of mutated state that has to be updated. And so this means that the UI toolkit, the single thread that the UI toolkit uses to perform these functions is the bottleneck. Because if any of these tasks takes a great deal of time, the other tasks won't get done. So if you have a listener that executes for longer than, let's say, a second, that means that for that whole second, 
um, the user interface thread won't be able to pull events off of the queue and it won't be able to update the UI and for all intents and purposes to the user the application appears to have frozen. So the solution here is to bring other threads into the picture but it's a little more complicated than that because it turns out having multiple threads interacting with the user interface simultaneously is really, really hard. In fact, some people think it's impossible to get right. So every GUI, GUI toolkit that's in mainstream use today has an architecture where the background threads perform operations and then pass state back to the UI thread and the UI thread performs the update. Um, and it turns out that this architecture is exactly the same in the browser, um, but the problem is that the browser doesn't actually have background threads. So the question is, might we ever get some? Um, and it turns out that it doesn't look like we're gonna get background threads in the browser. <laughs> By the way, thanks to James Duncan Davidson for the lovely picture uh, <laughs> of Brendan Eich. Um, and so it doesn't look like we're gonna get threads anytime soon. Um, but there is a happy ending to the story. So we talked about um, earlier how XHR kind of gave us this little way to bypass this world of reloading. And in fact, what it really kind of gave us was this kind of single purpose way of doing something kind of on another thread where you could go off and talk to a server, and when it's ready, it's gonna call back into your code. And so we could start doing a lot of things in that mode where we could go back, do something, wait for a response from the server. But it wasn't client stuff. It wasn't you could just go ahead and do some computationally intensive thing. It was, I'm just gonna to talk to the server, have it do something, it can do some crazy stuff for me, and return back. But we need to do more. We're doing more and more on the client, and so we need more than just XHR. So some other solutions came about. Uh, the Google Gears team uh, added database support into Gears to be able to do things like off -mail, offline Gmail. And once you do that, whenever you talk to the database, it was happening on that same thread that Ben was talking about. So it would be freezing your experience while it did database access. So they went and put that off into another process, created something called Worker Pool, which allows you to do this stuff kind of on the side in its own world, and again, have callbacks into the main UI thread. So they did that for a practical reason, and then we thought, well, it makes sense to extend that and let developers to do it. We could also use other technologies, like Java or Flash, to give us the same kind of thing. It's some kind of hook where we can say, go ahead and spawn a thread and do something. But we want this in the open web platform itself. So we've taken a bunch of this stuff and packaged it together, and now one a subset of kind of the HTML5 world is what's called web workers. And web workers are all about this thing, offloading the processing. So how about we take a look at a little uh, example. What we're gonna see in this example is we're gonna do annealing, all that is is a fancy way to say we're gonna draw a path between some random um, points on a graph and we're kicking it off without a web worker and as soon as we gotta try and analyze that, it freezes the browser and we simulate that by uh, seeing that the icon, which is an animated GIF or whatever, you, just stopped working. And then finally, it did all of those tests and came back. Now we turn on web workers, the browser's running very happily. We go back, we can, res we can uh, work with the browser, we can mouse over things, we can still interact, and then finally when the results come back. So the key message here is now with the web worker API, you have the ability to do much, much more in your applications, offload it, and still give you the responsiveness that the users dictate from you. There are some drawbacks. Um, for example, if you look at the concurrency APIs in other platforms, you may notice that some of them are fairly mature and have a lot of functionality to offer, such as the Java concurrency APIs on the left, whereas if you look at the web worker API on the right, We've got a ways to build up the sort of <coughs> complex, mature concurrency APIs that you might imagine. So what's actually missing are things like sleep and yield. Um, in other words, being able to intelligently throttle uh, what that background thread is doing. Um, and uh, we're hopeful that in future versions of uh, the HTML5 spec, we'll see that in the browsers, we'll implement stuff like that as well. Um, so another thing we wanna talk about is just simply performance. For example, in this case, this is uh, something called Pixastic. It's an online image editor that uses Canvas. I've just clicked on the uh, green button to desaturate the image, and my browser is just sort of sitting there. Now, we could use web workers to make this more responsive and eliminate things like the script dialog, the stop script dialog, but um, I can't <coughs> really get around the basic performance limitations of the JavaScript runtime. 
Um, and in, in an application like an image editor, even if we push the image manipulation to a background thread to a, a web worker, that doesn't really meet the user's expectation of, hey, I just want to perform this effect because now I'm going to manipulate the image after I perform that effect. You know, making the application responsive while I'm waiting is one thing, but it really doesn't help me. I need faster throughput. Um, and so we want to talk about that for a minute. Yeah, so browsers with JavaScript, everyone's kind of made fun of JavaScript in the past, and uh, the actual runtime engine has been just like a little interpreter and kind of like a toy compared to doing benchmarks with like a JVM or a CLR uh, or what have you, but that world has all been changing. While the browser Chrome itself has kind of gotten simpler, if anything else, the engine has really been changing in the last uh, several years. And now it's kind of come out to fruition. Across a lot of these modern browsers, uh, you soon see new JavaScript engines that aren't just twice as fast, three times as fast, a magnitude fast, faster than what they were doing before. And they do it all through just-in-time compilation and trace-based jitting and all these, all these cool things. But the net result is, for free, we're getting in a world where we won't, don't have to worry about the same things in the same places that we did before. So if you're trying to build this engine that's very, very complicated and rich on the client, things that you have to work around because of the JavaScript limitations are somewhat going away. So it's really exciting to kind of pair together the fact that you can do web workers and do stuff off process, and the fact that you can just run things faster in general, it means that there's a whole new world available. So some of the areas where the JavaScript runtimes aren't quite there yet um, are, for example, garbage collection. So uh, typically with garbage collection, uh, in most browsers you see traditional mark and sweep, where once, once you fill up the heap, then you've got this process that has to go through and analyze the entire heap and collect it, and this can lead to interface latency um, in applications that use memory quite a bit. And Google Chrome has just introduced generational GC into their browser, which lets you split this up so that most of the objects will be created in a much smaller space that's much easier to uh, mark and sweep. Um, and it turns out only the small subset of objects that actually live for a long time go into a larger space, and so the browser doesn't have to pause the UI for quite as long. And over at Mozilla, we're actually investing a lot in garbage collection. We've got some specialists that we brought on board, and so we're really excited to bring some innovation to this space too. But it's one area where we just, we, we just aren't in complete control of the latency as app developers, and so we're hoping to, to get that fixed. And in fact, one of the other things that we're doing is introducing uh, an open web memory profiling tool uh, this summer, um, imminently, that uh, give us as developers more introspection into what's happening with the memory usage in the browser, what's happening with garbage collection, and we're really excited to be able to sort of crack open the runtime and take a look at these areas that we just haven't been able to look at before that impact our ability to create really responsive applications. And in fact, as we talk about creating amazing applications, um, it's time to wrap up. Yeah, so we've talked about the responsiveness side, but there's also many other things happening in the web platform that allow you to change users' expectations entirely. Just like Google Maps change your expectations of what you can do on a map versus the original MapQuest, with these technologies, we're excited to be able to do the same thing. With Canvas, you get away from boxes and text, and you can do anything you want. You can draw any of these things that are out there. And um, with desktop integration, we're opening the browser up to be able to talk to all of the services that you have on your platform. And so in conclusion, um, you know, sort of with the introduction of the Ajax revolution, we were able to do things with web applications that really had never been done before. These things were able to take flight in ways that just no one had ever seen, and we really introduced amazing applications on the web. But with these investments, what we're really seeing is an emergence of a new phase where applications on the web can become as compelling and as rich as any other platform in the world, and we can really create the types of application experiences that we've always wanted to on any platform, finally on the web platform. Uh, we really appreciate being able to speak to you guys. Thank you, and thanks for the time. Thanks.